So our next speaker is Joe Dunkley. Joe is a professor in physics and astrophysical sciences at Princeton University. She shared the 2018 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics with a, um, a larger team and uh, uh, their work for mapping the universe at its very early days. And she also won this year's New Horizons in Physics Prize for developing new techniques to extract fundamental physics from astronomical data. My understanding of this is it's really astronomically large data sets that get squeezed down to something that we actually can interpret and try to make sense out of. The title of her talk is Signals from the Beginning of Time, Our Quest in the Next Decade. So please join me in welcoming Joe to the stage. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, and so I'm thrilled to be talking to you about um, this quest of ours to, oh, not that, uh, to look for signals from the beginning of the universe. And so as a cosmologist, the kind of questions I ask are, how did we get to be here over the 14 billion year history of the universe? Did the universe really have a beginning? Um, and um, is, I realize these are not my current slides. Oh, good. <laughs> um, is space infinite? Um, why is space growing at all? And what made the Big Bang happen? Um, and, and I do this by looking as far out into space as I can, which takes me as far back in time as possible. Because there's this wonderful trick of doing astronomy that the further you look back, the longer light is taken to reach you, as the further back in time you get to see. So in our solar system, that might take us hours back in time because of the scale of it. But when you look out into the stars, that would take us tens, hundreds of thousands of years back in time just by looking at the stars in the night sky, the ones in our Milky Way. And so we live in this Milky Way galaxy full of about 100 billion stars, but we can then step out to distant galaxies, and this is our, our own Milky Way, we can step out to a distant galaxy um, like this one, where we're seeing something where we're looking millions or billions of years back in time just by looking at a distant galaxy at all. And if we go out to the furthest reaches of space, this is a beautiful image from the Hubble Space Telescope, of a little patch of space where every one of those dots of light is a galaxy, each with about 100 billion stars in it. Um, and we think that there are kind of 100, 100 billion of those in the visible universe alone. And just by looking at those ones, the most distant ones, we're taking a step back billions of years in time. But I actually try and look beyond where there were even galaxies. The galaxies that we see in the sky, they haven't always been there. Um, and if we can take a step back far enough, we actually get to a point back in the early part of the universe when there weren't any galaxies or any stars at all. And I take this picture with, with people I work with, with teams of people, of this rather unusual picture that's the very earliest picture we have of the universe. It's the very earliest snapshot we have. It's a picture of the universe when it was only about 400,000 years old. Um, and if we go back to that time, then there weren't any galaxies, there weren't any stars or planets. There was basically just this sea of hydrogen and helium gas, um, and we think interspersed by some invisible dark matter particles and these rays of light. Um, and and this funny, this funny image you see, which you, you may have seen before, you may not, right? It's, it's, it looks featureful, these blue and white spots, what are they? It captures the temperature of this light that's been traveling to us since almost the beginning of time. And the, temp and the color of that blobby picture shows you the temperature of the light, but it really traces the underlying density of space, of this sea of hydrogen and helium atoms. And if, actually, if you step back to the beginning of the universe, the universe is really very, very smooth, almost completely uniform. But it had these very tiny over-dense regions and under-dense regions. And those are captured by the colors in this speckledy picture. And those are so important because they are the seeds of everything that we are now made of. We are here now because there were these little lumps and bumps back at the beginning of the universe where a little bit of space was ever so slightly denser in, in hydrogen and helium gas than a bit over there. And, and what's remarkable is we can then trace forward the idea that those little lumps and bumps at the beginning of the universe grew by gravity over millions of years to eventually form the first baby galaxies. 
So hydrogen and helium gas would gather together, clump into a kind of mini galaxy, and eventually ignite the first stars. So the fact that we can see the beginnings of that back then and then trace it through is incredible. And this picture was taken with um, the Planck satellite, um, which I worked on, um, which measures this very faint light. And it has to measure microwave light, so it's measuring things of about a millimeter in wavelength. Um, and this kind of followed up the doubly mapped satellite that I worked on previously that previously won the Breakthrough Prize. Um, so this launched 10 years ago, and it made this, made this great image. Um, and, and so we have this situation where we think we can now follow through from kind of 400,000 years of time all the way through to today um, of the universe's evolution. But the thing is, we now have, we're left with these, these questions. So one of the things about the sea of galaxies we see around us in the universe is they all appear to be moving away from each other. The universe seems to be growing um, such that everything on average moves away from everything else. And we are quite convinced now that we are the kind of product of 14 billion years of evolution of the universe. Um, but my questions are, you know, how did those lumps and bumps, sorry, how did those lumps and bumps of matter get to be there in the first place? What produced them at the beginning? And a connected thing is what actually made the, begin, the universe begin to expand in the first place? You know, how, how did the Big Bang happen? Can I go right back to the, the earliest moments and understand what happened? And that's what we're trying to, that's, that's what we are trying to do in the next decade, is try and find a particular signal of the Big Bang that we've been searching for for a while now. Um, because there are some ideas of what could have been happening actually at the Big Bang itself. And one of the most popular models, which is not a complete theory, we still don't understand all the physics of it, is this thing called inflation that actually won the, the, the first breakthrough prize for the theory of it. Um, and the idea is that if you step back to the very first fraction of a second of the universe, you don't even have particles that we're familiar with. We just have, we think, this kind of energetic field permeating the, the universe. And we think also that, that the physics that described it made the universe expand incredibly fast, very briefly, um, in, you know, blowing up a space smaller than the, the, the nucleus of an atom up to bigger than a star in just a, a split second. And we think that that kind of produced the universe, could have produced the universe that we kind of now live in um, that could have started in this way. Now, if this happened, it makes this really interesting prediction that we are searching for, which is that the energetic expansion of the universe um, at the beginning should have actually rippled space-time itself. It should have put in gravitational waves, which are what happens, which have been discovered uh, by the LIGO experiment just in the last few years from pairs of black holes spiraling around each other. This also won the Breakthrough Prize, and Samina Sankey will talk about this more this afternoon. So LIGO just discovered these, these ripples in space-time emanating from these black holes spiraling around each other um, and distorting space-time as they go. But we are now looking for these same gravitational waves, not from in-spiraling black holes, but from the actual Big Bang itself, that the, that the expansion of space at the beginning, we think, could have rippled space enough that we could actually see these gravitational waves now. Um, and so a little, let's see if this... No, okay, this was supposed to be an animation, so I'm just going to describe it. Okay, so <laughs> if a gravitational wave is, a is traveling towards you, anywhere in the room, then actually space itself would squeeze in as it travels towards you, squeeze in and stretch this way, and then squeeze back out again and stretch this way in and out, or this way and this way, diagonally out, inwards and outwards. They're genuinely, space would change in its size as this wave passes through. Um, and... These are, this is what's been discovered beautifully by the LIGO experiment from these black holes, where you take a pair of arms of the experiment and you watch the arms change length as a gravitational wave passes through, and by looking at the arms changing length, you can see it. Now, LIGO is a beautiful experiment, but it cannot find our gravitational waves from the Big Bang because you'd need those arms to be sort of intergalactic length. Um, we are looking for gravitational waves that are kind of waves that, that kind of traverse you know, half of the sky, and they were strongest at the, in the early universe. They're kind of not so, uh, they'll be very tiny here today, 14 billion years later. 
So we have to figure out how to find the signature of these, these ripples in space-time that happened at the beginning by looking back to the beginning. And so what we're doing is actually looking at this, let's get past this. <coughs> we are looking at um, this, this, this early light that's, that's called the cosmic microwave background, that speckledy red and, red and blue light I showed you. We're trying to find the imprint of these gravitational waves on that light, on that image. Now, how do we do it? So this is just a little cartoon of, of the polarization of light. So when you measure light, it might be unpolarized, so you have the same amount of light in, in, two, in two different directions. Or it might be polarized, a preferential direction that it's, that it's traveling in, that's, that it's got its energy in. The neat thing is that we're measuring this light that set off almost 14 billion years ago, just 400,000 years after the Big Bang. If a gravitational wave was passing through, squeezing and stretching space, it has this neat effect of polarizing the light because it squeezes in one direction and squashes out in the other direction. And it makes the light wave um, vibrate preferentially in this direction as the, light is, as the gravitational wave is passing through. So what we're doing is we're now trying to make a new image of this early light, this cosmic microwave background, where we look really specifically or really in detail at the polarization of it. And we try and see this pattern of gravitational waves having passed through. Um, and we're doing that from these two, um, I'll go to this one first actually, two locations on Earth. Okay, so recently we've had our great successes in this field from satellite missions, from WMAP and then Planck made these all sky images of this cosmic microwave background light, this first image of the, the universe. But to, to make really accurate polarization measurements, where again, you sort of point a telescope everywhere in the sky, and you measure this very faint light. I didn't mention that that light is so faint that it's only three degrees above absolute zero, minus 270 degrees. And the features we're looking for are kind of one part in a millionth of that, or actually one part in a billionth going down to measure it, to look for the gravitational wave signals. So you need incredibly precise instruments to do that. And, and the ones that we've flown so far, WMAP and Planck, they just, they didn't have the sensitivity to do this. So the next decade of progress in this research is coming from these two great sites on Earth where we point telescopes and measure this faint microwave light. And the two sites are at the South Pole, um, which is pictured here, um, and in northern Chile in the Atacama Desert, which is where the projects I now work on are. This is, this is the South Pole site, and actually that larger telescope on the, on the left um, is the South Pole Telescope, which is part of the Event Horizon Telescope that you'll hear about from Chep. Um, and the one on the right, the little dish um, on the top of the building, um, is called the Bicep Telescope. Um, and they actually thought they might five years ago have seen this gravitational wave signal from the Big Bang. Uh, it turned out that they were sort of confusing a signal coming from really far away with a signal actually coming from quite up close in our own Milky Way galaxy, which also sends out the same kind of microwave light signal. So one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing is to try and disentangle uh, you know, light coming from billions of year, light years away from light coming from really up close in the Milky Way galaxy we live in. Um, so you know, this, this program at the South Pole will continue, but I'm really excited about um, our new telescopes that we're installing in Chile um, in these next couple of years. So this, this, this image pictured here is the northern Chilean desert. It's very close to the Bolivian border. Um, it's incredibly dry, which if you're looking at microwave light is exactly what you need. You need very dry conditions, as li little water vapor above you as possible. So this site is at 5,000 meters elevation. It's beautiful. It's, it's a bit like being on a different planet up there. Um, it's just stunning, and it's, and it's really a very popular astronomical site now. There's a big telescope called ALMA that's, um, that's, that's up there too. The telescopes pictured in, this, in, in here are a set of ones that we're currently operating, but we're now building a whole new suite of telescopes, four or five new telescopes as part of the Simons Observatory. Um, which we've been supported to do by uh, the Jim and Marilyn Simons uh, Foundation. And we are putting kind of new telescopes with thousands of detectors to really carefully and precisely measure the polarization 
of this microwave background light. Um, so they're going to be, again, I don't have a pointer, but on the right-hand side of this image, there's a little space on the plateau at the front, and we're basically starting construction there um, now, and we should have the telescopes there in 2021, 2022. Um, and we'll then be scanning the sky, about a tenth of the sky, for five years, just like staring, 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 staring at this faint light that's been traveling for 14 billion years to reach us. And we'll make a new image of it, and we'll see if any of the, these, these gravitational wave signals are there. And that's just a picture of one of the telescopes in Chile right now doing that will be upgrade, that will be re replacing with something new. Uh, we won't be looking for the Milky Way and the stars. <laughs> we'll be looking for the microwave light coming from beyond. Um, and um, yeah, so, and so let, what, what will we see? There are two, there are two options. <laughs> one is in the next decade, 2029, where will we be? We'll either have detected gravitational waves from the early universe. If we do, I hope we do. There are a lot of theories that say that we have a good chance of doing it, given how big the signal is. We'll be basically improving tenfold our measurement of where we are today by the next decade. So we have a really good chance of seeing it. If we do, then I'm pretty sure we'll be then flying a new satellite, doing a whole lot more measurements to really understand the signal better, to try and really grasp the physics of what was happening to produce this, these, these ripples in space-time at the Big Bang. If we don't, it'll be really interesting. I think that if we haven't seen it in 10 years, and we've kind of ruled out a whole load of possibilities that could have produced these signals, then, then I, I, I sort of predict that lots of theorists will start thinking of whether we've got our understanding of the beginning of the universe a bit wrong and might start coming up with new ideas. I think either way will be extremely interesting. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll, be, we'll be, the next 10 years, I'm sort of, I'm so excited about making these new images of the sky from the South Pole and from Chile um, and finding out how, how it all began. Thank you. <coughs> I see questions. That was a great talk. I'm wondering, do we have the um, technology we need in terms of material science or optics or whatever you need to actually do these detections? That's a really good question. So one of the biggest challenges we've had, so to do these detections, we're measuring a set of sort of billionth of a degree variations in microwave light. And so we use these um, bolometer detectors to, to measure it. And they're these transition edge sensor superconducting devices that work well, but you know, someone coming up with something even better to, to measure these very fine temperature variations would be, would be welcome. One of the big challenges is that we've scaled up from kind of tens of hundreds of detectors to now fielding on the sky, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands, and actually reading out the signals from thousands and thousands of detectors is also a technological challenge that we're trying to, that we're, um, you know, get, getting around, but also trying to bring in expertise on. Um, the telescopes themselves are, uh, typically often aluminium or solid structures that I think that the technology for us is, is the detectors detecting this faint light. Yeah. My question is about the future, not about the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, what uh, we could learn from the Big Bang and from everything we know, and maybe we would know more about the future. So uh, how the universe would look like, say, in, the, in 14 billion years from now? That's a good question. So one thing I do, there's two, two, two parts of that. One thing that's quite amazing is how much we can already predict about the future of the universe just from knowing gravity and just following it forward. So for example, five billion years from now, the Andromeda galaxy, our neighboring galaxy, will collide with the Milky Way. We will mix, we'll become a huge different galaxy, the night sky will change. We know that's gonna happen just because we can follow the laws of gravity. One of the mysterious things though, is that we seem, the space seems to be growing faster and faster. It's this mysterious dark energy component that also won the Breakthrough Prize a number of years ago. Um, and we don't know what that is. And so we don't know if space is gonna, you know, soon start expanding even faster. We could imagine very far in the future, all the galaxies would have raced so far away from each other that an individual galaxy, person living in a gal one galaxy would look out and they wouldn't see any others. That could happen far in the future. So. Um, 
try to understand the physics of the early universe may reveal more to us about this mysterious dark energy component. They may be connected. So, it, you know, it may or may not reveal more about the future. That's not a naive question at all. So two answers to that. So it is true that right now, so from the south, from the, from the Chile, we can map half the sky. So we can see up towards the northern hemisphere, but not completely. We are trying to explore two new possible sites that are the other great low water vapor sites in um, Tibet and Greenland. Um, so there's actually an exploratory telescope going to Tibet, I think, next year to try and see if the site's good enough to look at the northern hemisphere for, from. Um, but the connected part is, um, you know, I think if we, again, if we detect something, and there are even plans, there's a plan for a Japanese satellite called Lightbird that would actually then map the whole sky because you can from space. So uh, I guess those, those two, there will be those two parts. Um, but, but the fact is that having a really great observation site is not a trivial thing. So being able to see half the sky from Chile is still pretty good. But yeah, this, this. 